Okay, uh, moving, uh, moving onward. We'll talk about a, a few things. Uh, what we're talking about here is transfers by U.S. persons to foreign corporations in exchange for shares. Transfers by U.S. persons to foreign corporations in exchange for shares. Underlying all of this is uh, what I refer to uh, Congress's messianic goal. And what is that goal? Not allowing any economic gain to escape U.S. taxation, okay, except for that 10% of QBI, except for that, to force recognition by U.S. taxpayers of any gain which economically occurs while that, while that U.S. person owns whatever the asset is. Now, let's look at this from the context of a U.S. versus uh, foreign uh, situation. Let's say that we say U.S to U.S. here, and then U.S. to foreign over here. If uh, X over here transfers an asset, let's say uh, the asset has a basis uh, of zero and a fair market value of 100. If we have that situation, and if Section 351 which is transferred to a controlled corporation, applies. What happens here? What uh, is the basis of the asset in the hands of Y? I have, uh, well, let me step back a moment. Have you studied at all transfers to controlled corporations uh, in, uh, I, I assume you're, a lot of you are taking a uh, subchapter C course? Uh, Logan, you sort of nodded your head, but I'm not sure whether you were nodding because I asked or because you were you just nodded your head uh, generally. Uh, yes. So there must be no gain or loss if it's, if, if it's in exchange for as well. Right. Okay. So now, why do you think why do you think that is the case? No gain or loss. In, and now, again, 351 says that uh, to meet the conditions, Y has to be a corporation. X could be an individual. X could be another corporation. Could be either. But Y has to be a corporation. And immediately after the transfer, X, or if there's more than one transferor, the transferors own in the aggregate 80% or more of Y. Now, why would the tax law include something like this? But the long and short is this. One of the overriding policy objectives of the code, now you may not believe this, but it is there various places, and it's, of course, not there many places as well. But an overall policy objective is let people decide how they want to conduct business. Don't force them into one approach or another solely because of taxation. Let them decide based on their own commercial needs and other legal needs, but not taxation. So the thought is, if there has not been any meaningful change in the economics regarding an asset, then don't treat that as a realization event that requires taxation at the time of transfer. So if X transfers this 100 fair market value uh, asset that has a basis of zero to Y, there's really no, there, there's not, in a sense, a, an arm's length realization event. And we want to 
encourage them to do this because, gee, they think it's commercially better or for some other reason legally better. That's the logic behind it. Now, in the domestic context, US to US, is the US ultimately going to get the benefit of any gain if Y sells the asset? Yeah, Y is a US taxpayer. What about uh, depreciation? Say this asset is a fixed asset that Y is going to use in its business. Is it going to get any depreciation deductions? No, it won't. So again, we're getting to, in a sense, the right answer. The transfer is tax-free, and the basis is a carryover basis or substituted basis, or the idea being that you have a zero-sum gain from a tax standpoint. OK, now let's go to the other side. And now we'll say we have x, we have y, but gee, there's a border there. And we have the same basis of zero and 100 of fair market value. Now what happens with respect to any future income inside Y? If that asset is sold by Y, will the US realize any benefit? We have guilty. Maybe there will be some guilty. Maybe there won't be. Maybe it's all other E&P, as we've discussed, that would be subject to the 245 cap A. But as a practical matter, once the asset is transferred, it's outside of US taxing jurisdiction. If we look at 367A, uh, who has a code with 367A open? Ah, Jen, yes. You do. OK, what do you find? It says uh, transfers of property from the United States, general rule, if in connection with any exchange described in 332, 351, 354, 356, or 361, the US person transfers property to a foreign corporation, such foreign cor corporation shall not, for purposes of determining the extent to which gain shall be recognized on such transfer, be considered to be a corporation not considered a corporation, so it's not going to get the transfer basis and the non-recognition under 351. Yeah. Now, notice a couple of things. Number one, it, it doesn't directly say the transaction is taxable. It doesn't actually say that. What it says is it shall not be considered to be a corporation. Now, I would love to say and tell you why they chose to do it that way. I'm not sure. Well, the, the, by referring to uh, 351, was it 332, 351, 354, and so on, by referring to those, those are only <laughs> tax-free transaction sections. So we, we're starting out with a transaction that already qualifies for some tax-free treatment. The point that Jen was making was that if we look to Section 351, 351 says that Y has to be a corporation for 351 to be relevant in the first place. OK, so if 367 says that, that Y will not be treated as a corporation, OK, that means 351 no longer is applicable for the transfer of this asset. If 351 doesn't apply, what applies? Just normal 101 realization event. Yeah, normal realization event taxation, section 1001. So it becomes a taxable transaction. So when X transfers to Y on the, uh, the US to foreign side, this is just like any other transaction. What's the fair market value of what X receives minus the basis of what it gave up? What did X receive? Ah, oh, it received the fair market value, or it received shares which have a fair market value. In the case of a 
wholly owned subsidiary situation, I think it's probably fair to say that the value of those shares are maybe best measured by the value of the asset which is transferred. But you could have differences. Now, I said that with respect to the particular asset, there will not be a 351 transaction and you'll have taxability. Well, I made a point of saying an asset. What about the case where there's a transfer of an asset, but instead of zero basis and 100 fair market value, maybe it's 50 fair market value and 100 of basis, so that it's a depreciated asset, not an appreciated asset. Does 367A, does it say anything about loss transactions? No, only gain. Only gain. And if you look into the regulations, it's an asset by asset test. So, well, gee, what does that mean for a loss transaction? You don't net it, right? But what does it mean in terms of the application of Section 351 and the basis rules and so on? Non recognition is not going to recognize your loss. Right. No recognition of loss by X. There will be a substituted basis in terms of X's interest in the shares of Y, substituted basis, so that. X will increase its basis in Y by 100. But then the basis of the asset in Y is limited to the fair market value. And why is that? Because the code does not let you get two loss benefits. This is uh, 362E 